I'm here because I want to, I've been at Concordia for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years this summer. And I think that's a good time to reflect on one's role in a, in a university and anyone's job. I actually never thought I'd stay at any one job for that long, ever in my whole life. We were taught that we'd be on contract forever as you know the Generation X, Generation Y, whatever. So the fact that I managed a tenure track position right out of library school is a little bit shocking, but cool nonetheless. And specifically, uh, in the last 10 years, I've calculated, and I do this because we keep pretty good statistics at the library, that I've helped over 15,000 students in the last 10 years. Um, I've also spent a little bit under half a million dollars in books, which are sitting in the stacks waiting for you to borrow. Also sitting in some servers, not me personally, because <laughs> that's what librarians do, right? We help people, but then we buy stuff. So half a, a, less than half a million, like, 400 and some change, thousand uh, dollars. But that's pretty good. And about uh, three times that amount I managed in subscriptions for journals and databases and all that stuff, which is, you know, that's a pretty good commitment to, to the university. Now, the journey I want to talk about is specifically dealing with the last uh, three years, since 2010, okay? And for different reasons, for personal reasons, because in that time, since 2010, uh, I got married. Actually, 2009, but late. So. I, I had, with my wife, two beautiful children, two, two beautiful daughters that are now eight months and two years old. And we bought a, a, a house out, off the island of Montreal, a 200-year-old house that we we're renovating. And I also started a PhD in law. Okay? So all those factors contribute to kind of reflecting upon how one approaches their job for obvious reasons, time constraints and whatnot. Um, let me give you a little bit more context about what I, I do on a day-to-day -day basis. As a business librarian, I work with the John Wilson School of Business, which means the seven, over 7,000 undergrads and 1,500 grads can contact me and one of my two other colleagues with precise, difficult research questions. And I have to be enabled to answer them with the resources that we have from the library. Hi, I'm on in. Just getting started, getting warmed up. I plugged all my toys together. <laughs> So, so how do we do this? Well, there's a few, a few touch points, a few models that we have to roll out a library program for the John Wilson School of Business. Uh, one of them is the reference desk and reference service, so people can chat and talk to us via the reference desk or email us, and that's picked up by all of the librarians and all of the library staff in rotation. So that's kind of the generic service, frontline service as it's seen. Anytime there's a more precise question, then it gets rooted to the subject specialist. For my first uh, six, seven years at Concordia, I was the Accountancy and Decision Sciences Librarian, so I wasn't the lead for marketing and management. So what I did during that time was work with the Information Literacy Committee to try to formalize the role of the library within JMSB. And for different reasons, we got really enthusiastic interest, but then when we wanted to implement specific models, it kind of fizzled for different reasons, too many stakeholders, uh, too many options, too many great things to do, so it kind of fizzled. And so when I came back from sabbatical, uh, my colleague, Adria Harlan, uh, who was the marketing and management librarian spearheading these programs, uh, went on to become the head of interlibrary inter loans, so a different department in the library. And I took on the role of marketing and management librarian. And the reason why marketing and management is such an important subject fund area for the library is because most of the first year undergrad classes in JMSB are marketing and management. Those are the, you know, everybody takes them prereq classes for all of the other core classes in the program. So just to give you an example, COM 210, which is con uh, critical business thinking, has 21 sections in the fall, eight sections in the winter, and two in the summer, okay? And that's, that's a, the management class. That's where they learn how to do a research paper, essentially. And then uh, business communication, which is their first marketing class, has about the same, 22 sections in the fall, nine sections in the winter, and two sections in the summer. So that's about 60 sections overall. And the model that we have, that we've been developing, is the information literacy model, where we visit these classes to teach students how to use the different tools, teach them about Wikipedia and Google, and the kind of essential tools that you need to survive as a you know, good undergraduate student. Now the problem with that is, I'm personally responsible to cover those 60 sections. Right, 40 sections in the fall, 20 sections in the winter. I've been covering about 10% of those. 
okay? There's two reasons for that. First of all, it's a time constraint. If all the professors wanted me in the third week of class, I would do nothing but this. And if you look at the schedule, there are classes that start 8.30 in the morning, concurrent classes all the way up to 10, 10 o'clock at night. So it's impossible to cover all those sections without me just doing that. And I have other duties like buying books and going to committees and answering questions from students. So what we've been doing, which we have been able to cover, is cover a second to third year class, which is entrepreneurship, COM 320. And I cover about 80% 80 80 of the sections there. And those are more ma manageable because we have 11 sections in the fall, 14 in the winter, and seven in the summer. So it's evenly, it's better spread out throughout the year, but it's still a lot, right? I average about 50 lectures a year. So that's my 60 minute lecture, that I go into a class and I say, okay kids, okay people, okay busy parent, you know, taking one or two classes in the evening, you have to write a business plan, which is the entrepreneurship class, very research intensive project. It's one of the most intensive research projects in their undergrad. And I, I get involved because that's where I get most of my questions from. Hi, good morning, come on in. <laughs> um, so that's my issue. Uh, over 7,000 undergrads, 1,500 grads, that's my, I'm, I'm talking about, I'm, I'm doing this uh, violin, you know. <laughs> I want people to pity me, but don't, don't worry about that. Uh, 60, 60 sections a year for the 200 level commerce class and about, about 25, 30 for the 300 level undergrad class. So I've been covering 10% of the first year and 80% of the third year because that's what I could manage with me and my colleagues, pulling in my colleagues and sharing the load with these kinds of 60 minute to, to uh, 200 minute training sessions in class. So that model I knew was not sustainable. I knew was not reaching the students. I usually get two comments for stu from students at the end of these sessions. The first one is, I had no idea we had all of this. Okay, Which is, you know, okay, fair enough. You don't know what we had because you don't know what you don't know. And I've just, that's part of my role to open their eyes. I mean, the library does spend about $5 million a year on stuff that's not on the free web. And if you know nothing but the free web, i.e. Google and Wikipedia, of course you're going to be wowed by the library. And I'm not afraid to... I don't compete with Google because we actually do the same thing, we provide access to information, but Google does it on the free web and I pay for stuff. So we actually have very different operations. So I had no idea we had all this stuff. And the second thing they tell me is, I wish I had known this in my first year. I wish you had come to my whatever 200 level class and done this same speech. Now I have done that, I have tried that to get this going for the 200 level class despite the fact that there was no way I could cover all the sections. The problem with that is it's too early in, the, in their undergrad. The way the business, uh, the business uh, degree works is they, they have to do a little bit of research, but not that much in their first year, right? So they can get by with whatever they're using, but then it really gets intensive in their second and third year. So that wasn't the right moment to catch all of them, but if I wanted to catch all of them at the right time, then it got really hard to look through the curriculum for the right spot to put these things. Anyway, so of course, the best time to reflect about all this is holding a newborn baby in the middle of the night. I mean, that's when I had the best, the best, most fun time to think about all this. And I say, there must be a different way to do this. There must be a different model to bring this knowledge, this curriculum, into the hands of students. And that's why I started thinking about what, a, what it meant to be a tenured librarian, to have tenure status, uh, to be part of the faculty, to be a stakeholder in the, in the de deployment of a curriculum within the context of, of a university. And the paradox is, we have no class. I don't have a credit class where I can give my content. I don't have that structure at hand. And before the internet, of course people came to the library. They had to, there were no other books. I mean, you had a few books at home, but not enough to, you know, we had the books, so you, that would draw people in, but that's not the case anymore. So, uh, of course, as with anything, I started a blog. That's one of the very first things I did. After I realized, after my first year as the marketing and management librarian, after the birth of my first daughter, this is in 2010, after running after all those entrepreneurship classes to do my sessions, trying to cover some 200 level classes but not quite succeeding, asking my colleagues for help, but then still knowing that we were not systematic and automatic in providing this content, these are the two parameters that I wanted for my information literacy program, systematic and automatic. 
uh, failing completely at that, uh, I knew that I could not request 17 other librarians or how many other librarians I would need to cover this. I knew that if, even if I trained every LTA, every faculty member and every lecturer in the John Wilson School of Business, they would still not cover everyone in 100%. So I started to blog to, to cover new ways to teach, new ways to learn from the librarian's perspective, but also from the faculty perspective. And then I called it outfind.ca. It's a play on find out. Because find out was taken, and all the words I wanted were taken, and I didn't want the URL to be too long. And I think outfind is kind of nice as a, as a URL. And so, uh, just to put this on the table, I am a compulsive blogger. I have six blogs, of which this is the, the second most, uh, actually third most used. My, my main blog is culturelibre.ca, and I've been blogging on culturelibre for almost uh, eight years. It'll be eight years at the end of April. And uh, this is how I manage my digital identities. So Culture Libre is my research blog. This is where I talk about copyright law, digital, the digital world, and copyright reform, creative commons, fair dealings, all those questions, privacy issues, access to information issues. This is where I cover all this stuff. Uh, and I knew that uh, researching or looking, keeping an eye out for business instruction, business teaching, business curriculum, in Canada, in a university, as a librarian, would not fit within culturelibre.ca, right? So I'm, I'm still blogging on culturelibre. I just keep blogging about you know, my research, uh, my research interest, which is uh, uh, digital, the digital world and the law, mostly copyright. So I created Outfind in uh, 2011. And uh, the reason why I blog is I want to keep a trace of all the things that I, I read, the little reports and tidbits and ideas and stuff that I find interesting. And a lot of people ask me, does it take, does it take a lot of time to blog? <laughs> and I say, no, it saves me time. Because you know that report you read three years ago that you thought was really cool? What's the title of it? Where is it? You know, I remember it was about three years ago. It was from the uh, UNESCO. They have a open educational something. I type here in my search box, UNESCO, open education, and there it is. I can recall it instantly, okay? And that's been the beauty of my blog. I have the monthly archives, and I also have categories that allow me to pull things up, and the search. So the idea is I see a blog as a tool that saves me time. I also keep one of these guys. I actually have two. Right? It's the same idea as a blog, but the stuff that goes in here is, 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 is more, it's brut. It's not quite as ready as primetime blog. Right? So we can talk about that. That's not really the goal of my presentation, but I found this, this blog to be super useful in kind of understanding the stuff that's been going. And I'm, I'm sorry, John, John just stepped out, John Bentley from CTLS, because he's actually been very instrumental in bringing me into uh, this, this brave new world of e learning. Uh, and without him, I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be here in front of you right now to talk about this stuff. Now, before I show you the stuff that I've done, I also want to show you this short training, this short video about what is a MOOC, okay? Because you may, I have used the word MOOC in my title just for promotional purposes. I don't <laughs> personally aim to create a MOOC. Maybe, it's, it's, maybe it'll... It could become a MOOC in about five years' time, right? And that's one of the learning objectives of this session is to realize how much effort it takes to create a full-fledged MOOC, right? I'm seeing a MOOC as the uh, end of a continuum of e-learning. It is the most structured. It is the most, uh, what, how did I put it? Uh, shoot, did I not? Let me just. I see, yeah, it's, it, it's the most structured and paced learning uh, environment that I've found so far. So I'm seeing it as the end of the continuum and I'm providing you a midway report because I'm like slowly inching in that direction but I may not reach that destination in the end. I may just kind of stop midway for different reasons that I'll talk about. But be before I go on, I do want to make sure, do you, everybody, does everybody know what a MOOC is? Should I show you this video? Do you care? It's actually on MOOC.ca. Uh, which is from Stephen Downs. He's, uh, it's pretty good actually. Now I'm gonna fast forward here because it's really interesting, but this is the kind of, the idea, and, and that's the one that's proposed by this video, 
and it's on my blog should you want to watch, watch the full five minutes, but I know the attention span of people is kind of treading to Google, you know, Twitter and other, other attention grabbing things. Uh, but the idea is that if you put a lot of a MOOC in this, in this video, according to this video, is an event where a community deploys a whole bunch of resources to, uh, to attain learning objectives. That's a great model, but the problem I have is there's not enough content about the stuff I want to talk about out there on the internet, right? If I could glean a bunch of videos about how to use statistics, the census from Statistics Canada to write a business plan, or using uh, ratios from uh, SME benchmarking, which is a tool that uh, Industry Canada provides, or some of the advanced databases that we purchased, they're just not out there at all. So I found that this is a great model. This is something that I want to I want to aim at. Maybe not reach because I don't know if I'll need to in the end, but I have to create a lot of content. I have to be the one that puts out these little documents that people will traverse. This is the trajectory somebody was going to follow. You know, within the context of the remove the green line, right? So the idea is, to, in order to foster this kind of learning environment for my community, <laughs> I have to create a lot of it myself. And so. I bought some toys. <laughs> some of the toys that I bought are actually here right now. Uh, my tripod, uh, which is about $100. It's a South Standing Monopod, which is really cool because the, the three legs kind of pop back in. Uh, the camera, which is about $600, but I bought it because I have kids and you know, take pictures of kids as well. But Mike is about $100 on camera. And uh, it's a great thing. It's great to do little short videos when you're on the fly and you don't necessarily want to be in your office and you want to just bring it with you. I do that sometimes. This uh, microphone is about $150, fully compatible with Mac. And I do it because the mic, the embedded mics on the, the different la the laptop and the computer I have at home suck. And so um, I also bought the MacBook Pro, which I use the embedded camera a lot. But I, ha I use the external mic because the, the sound is horrible on these, on these machines. And so for less than $2,000, actually for less than one year's worth of professional development allowance, PDA, I was able to create my own private radio TV station mm -hmm. gear. That was my, and that's really cool. <laughs> I have a few other little tidbits of stuff like, you know, you need a mic, uh, you need a, a speaker, a good speaker, because the speaker sucks on these things. So I bought the, uh, the X-Mini, this guy, right? Really good, really good speaker for $30, very portable. Um, and I have, of course, my... Where is that? I'm sorry? Where is this? It's a, it's a speaker, right? Well, I didn't use it because we have the really nice speakers here in this room, right? Because it's embedded with this computer, but this thing opens up like that. And then you have a little plug here that plugs into the, the headphone jack. It, it works really well. I took it on vacation with my wife. I had the laptop and we were watching DVDs with this and it's pretty amazing the kind of sound that you, you have. Do that, you use that when you're giving a course? Uh, if I have to play a video and I don't want to be jacked into the sound system of the room, I do that. Also, I could do a screen record whenever I want to capture with QuickTime. Uh, like this video or like a newscast from CBC and I want to capture that for use in a further I use this because the QuickTime records the sound from the speakers so you have to have a good sound out and that's what I use for that okay so for about less than two thousand dollars I equipped myself with all this gear I also have a little bit of gear at home that I don't consider to be part of my you know studio my recording studio and it all fits in this laptop bag, which I got from Mountain Equipment Co-op, including, of course, my lunch bag, a few magazines for the train, and my other reading material. Water bottle, goodie, that kind of stuff, right? And, of course, your tablet, your, you know, wires, and a dog. Because you need to be prepared, right? So, I, this is my gear that I've used. And the first thing I did, right, which was my pilot project, is I recorded the videos that uh, I provided, I, I, I recorded myself giving my regular lectures, okay? Because I target a certain number of classes, COM 210, COM 212, COM 320, I had a set lecture. Like I could, in a half a second, 
pop into Comp 210 mode and recite the lecture that I gave for that class. Because it was a 60, 60 minute lecture. I gave it hundreds of times in my career, so I could just go ahead and do it. So I called John Bentley, which we had met earlier for a copyright training session I provided a few years ago. And I knew he did these kinds of things. And I called him up and I said, hey John, can I use you to do this? Can I ask you to film me and do my little training videos? And he was like, of course, that's my job. So I'm sorry he's not here right now because I could not be here right now without him. And so he has this awesome setup in his office, which inspired me for all this gear, where you sit at a, at a Mac like this, and he records you with the camera right above your head, and he screen records, and then he uses a, a flow, a screen flow, which is a kind of a nicer version of iMovie, to integrate the screen and the face capture into a single video. And let me show you how it works. Because I have put this on my YouTube channel. Okay, I have a YouTube channel that you could, uh, and this is what it looks like. So let me show you this one, which is the, uh, what is Google? So this is what John, and this, what, this is what makes it interesting, I think, and lively for people, is the fact that I'm there talking, and it's not just a screen overcast, you know, it's just a screen, a screen capture. It's actually me there explaining, and then you see the, the, the uh, uh, nonverbal communication established as well, a bit of empathy. But you do have to be, you do have to be, uh, well, ready to play with the camera. You have to work with the camera. You can't just be stiff. You have to smile and move around. And that kind of worked nicely. So we did this first set of videos, which uh, I included in a playlist on, on uh, YouTube, which I call, uh, which I call the uh, Google and Wikipedia for university students. So these, these videos, which amount to about uh, 40 minutes, 50 minutes, is the Comp 210, Comp 212 lecture, most of it that I provide in the classroom. Um, the other part is. So a you posted this on YouTube? Yes, on my own YouTube. We, I actually tried to get them on the university website. Yeah. I worked with the library's tech team because we have a web team, and they had to figure out how to embed a video, who's going to host it, where it's going to go. And we had some kind of JavaScript enabled plugin. And it failed on some browsers and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know what? Screw this. I'm just going to host it on my own YouTube channel and call it a day. Because it was too complicated. The technology wasn't quite there. And I, I record, uh, John recorded everything in high, high def. And the files were huge. So if you're, not, if you're using it on a mobile network, our servers were not delivering the compressed version of the file. So it, there was a bunch of issues with the fact that the library was hosting this stuff. So I'm like, you know what? And the great thing about YouTube is, if you link your Google Plus account to your YouTube account, you can actually post more than 15 minutes of videos. You can post videos as long as you want. So that's, that's what I did. I mean, there's a talk on, on streaming videos. Yes. Uh, My, from, from the library. Can we use this to, to post a lecture? You can certainly ask Jared about this. Uh, <laughs> I was doing this before they it were even. Work according to what you well, do. because I did this before Jared got the system up. That's the problem. Is this this dates back? This these first videos date back to 2011, and Jared was just starting to think about setting up this video streaming server. I'm going to record Adobe Connect videos, and I don't know where to put them because Concordia doesn't own Adobe Connect. I can meet in what it does. You know. I understand completely what you're going through. Had I been able to pitch this idea to Jared and get the library to okay it, I would have probably been able to host them there. But it was way before the streaming server was set up, so I just decided to do my own thing. There, yeah. is, also, there is also the 
speaking of Google being a popularity measurement tool, there's also the popularity of YouTube as opposed to this library. Exactly. I hey, honestly, that's part of the problem. The Google factor too. My it? URL was this long yeah. on the library website, and I can make it this long now. Okay. Now, one of the problems I encountered is, and I'll I'll I'll, I'll explain this, which is kind of strange. Uh, so the anyway, so the time timeline wise, in, in the summer of 2011, we recorded. John delivered uh, these videos, this set, and then another set, which is which is called "Use Articles to Research the Best uh, the Best Business Paper Ever," which is the other which is the other. Uh, um, Playlists, thank you, that, that we have up. That was in the, 2000, the summer of 2011. And then I launched that, but because it was a pilot project, I kept, I still kept giving my training sessions, right? So for that year, then my second daughter was born. <laughs> Again, more reflection. And that summer, summer of 2012, last summer, is when we recorded the Com 320, the entrepreneurship session. My name is Sharp. Which is, oh. <laughs> it's okay. You can keep, keep my statistics up. But I did present them to students, and I got a lot of great feedback from a few people saying, wow, this is awesome, uh, a few likes. And so now I got, I got into thinking, maybe I should start promoting this. So one of the ways that I promoted it was to include it in the course outline of the COM212, COM210 course outline. So they have a standard course outline at JMSP, so that's there. Uh, I've also created uh, with colleagues, with my colleagues, and this was a joint endeavor, well, we created a library website for the John Wilson School of Business, which is under Research Guides by Subject Business. And so this is the, this is the, the, the portal, the research portal we have for the business school, and the training videos are right here, along with a bunch of other guides. It's not quite, you know, I also added it to my, uh, to my footer on my email, because I do interact with students a lot by email. And I've just been talking to CASA, the student association, and they're gonna promote those videos on their website. So I'm trying to see how to best get students to use these things. Now, so far, I want you to, to, to keep in mind that the best that I've done is to film myself giving my classic lectures. I've just filmed myself doing what I used to do cut it up in size in smaller pieces and put it on the web, which is, which is a, an increase. It's better, right? It's an improvement on having to interact with me in person to get this knowledge. And just so you know, just doing that, I can look at precisely my statistics. Let me sign in to my Google account. Uh, I can see precisely how many people are using are using my videos and when. And it's really interesting the way it works out because if I go here to my, uh, to my statistics, look at this. If I change that to, wait a minute, let me just go back. This is for the last 30 days, but let me, let me make it for the last year, okay? And I could actually see when students are studying because I could see spikes. Exactly. Yes. I have here the day before Valentine's Day. Oh. <laughs> Actually, no, that one is February 20th. The day before Valentine's Day, I got another smaller spike, uh, which is right here. Anyways, it's really, so that was just during, just uh, during reading week, actually. And then here is just before the assignment is due, all right? And so I estimated that this, it, Google tells me that I, it's 7,000, 424 minutes. It actually went up by 100 minutes since I checked at 11 o'clock yesterday, which amounts to five days and two hours full time. Five days, so that's 20, 24 hours times five plus two, right? If you bring that into a regular work day, it is uh, 20 days of work, 20, 21 days. So I have been able to not work, so I, I'm gonna take the next month off and I'm just gonna go home and do nothing. Okay. Now, I have, you have to be careful with these metrics, right? Because here, you see for my most watched videos, uh, the number of views, the estimated total number of minutes watched, and the average watch time. 
the students will start a video and then turn away and do something else. So you have to be careful because it's not full views of full videos. I don't know how many students have actually gone through a full video, right? Um, another thing that I was able to test, because you, I still, even though uh, assessment is a, is a big concern, I, I haven't really worried about assessment too much because of these statistics, me, giving me the sense that, you know, this is a useful tool and I should keep it up. Um, one of the, one of the uh, a professor, a marketing professor for a 400 level class had a very precise project and I've been working with her for years uh, and I couldn't make her class. I, uh, I mean, I, had, I was sol book solid that month for a bunch of other lectures and I had stuff I couldn't move and I was on an advisory search committee for a bunch of different, I, I couldn't make it, right? And so I created for her a few training videos that I posted on, on a special playlist that I deleted later, but I was, it was there for the course of her assignment, which was gonna run for two, three weeks. And I could track precisely who used those videos during that period. And the response rate for a class of 68 people was about one third. And then after the, this event, I, I, I contacted her, emailed her, and I said, so how did your students do in your project? Oh, they didn't. They didn't do as well as the previous years because I had a, res and I knew it was because I had a response rate of one third as opposed to going to class and they're subjected to me. They have to go through my training session in class versus having them go and watch the session on their own, right? Now, how, how compelled should I feel of teaching these kids if they don't want to watch my video? Should I feel sad or should I not pursue this project because two thirds of the class didn't do what they were supposed to do to get a good grade and understand the project? You know, that's an interesting debate. I'm not gonna have it now, but I, I actually, for the one third of the students that did watch the videos, and thinking of all the other students and all the other classes that could not have seen me and watched those videos after the class, I think it's a good idea to pursue this project. So what do I have to do? You have to attach a character in some sort. Well, see, if, they, if it's more embedded, see, if, if, if they have to watch it and, and the, the professor reinforces that, and it's part of their assignment, it's in the terms of the assignment, for more tip, you know, watch this, you know, that kind of stuff, then it's, but in the end, they're adults and they should know better, right? But yeah, I know, I know, exactly. Uh, but I'm personally gonna pursue this project just because I've had a month's worth of work done for me by these videos. And that is just worth it for me, no, no question. Now, what's left? What am I doing right now to improve this? Because I have been filming myself. I call this filming theater, right? When TV came up, they just filmed theater to put it on TV, but they didn't adapt theater to make it sitcoms, so that would become interesting. The president called this, what did he call it yesterday? He had a great, he had a great tagline about what, what we shouldn't be doing, which is just transposing. He said he was transposing what we did before online. We have to do something new and different. So what I'm doing, I'm, keep, I'm blogging more and more just to keep, keep abreast of what's happening. I'm also formalizing my curriculum. I'm using a tool called Pressbooks, which is an EPUB generating file, uh, a service using WordPress to create an EPUB file, basically a book, an online book, and I'm writing my curriculum. And I'm writing out the learning objectives and I'm writing out uh, the content that I want to provide to students. This is the, this, is the, this is the full curriculum that I want to deploy throughout the JMSB program and hopefully embed different nuggets of this within specific classes so that they touch upon this content throughout their undergrad. So I, if I do nothing else, I want to be the blended librarian where this content becomes the blended part of the blended learning in faculty's classes and hopefully I can work with course coordinators to make this a reality. So I don't know if I'll ever achieve a full MOOC because that would mean that I would have my own course. But at least I want to create this content so that it can be embedded and students can interact with them either at their own pace, if they discover it uh, through the, my YouTube channel or through my blog, or with, within the context of a specific course that can populate uh, the online learning, you know, Moodle or first class, because they're still on first class in JMSB, to my great chagrin. Um, so there you go. So that's, that's one thing that I'm doing. Another thing that I wish I could do is have tests, quizzes associated with my content. 
I'm doing videos, but I can also do text, I could do images, but I wish I could do the step forward, which would be to have little JavaScript enabled quizzes like multiple choice, just to test to see the attainment of, of, of the learning objectives that I'm proposing to them within the context of this project. I can't do this because I, 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 I have learned how to program JavaScript. I do have a BCom in management of information systems and I was a programmer before and I have programmed. I haven't done that in about 10 years and I know other people are much better at it than I am, but I could code that. Um, I wish there was some kind of infrastructure within the university context to foster this kind of project, right? And this is where, I'm sorry? I'm sorry? Moodle is associated to a class and it's closed behind my Concordia. That's the structure of Moodle right now. I could, but I'd have to figure out within IITS and fight the bureaucracy somehow to figure this one out. I could also use eConcordia, but that's a private, you know, for-profit. It, it won't work. Could work. It could work. But so I'm suggesting to the community that maybe what we need is, a, is an initiative. And I was inspired by uh, Alan Shepard's uh, speech yesterday, our president, when asked, what is the best way forward in e-learning? He said it was gonna be a mix of top down and bottom up. Well, I'm from the bottom <laughs> up. I suggest that the bottom gets together around the concept of Concordia X, and I'm calling it Concordia Experimental. And so being a red-blooded digital native that I am, I whipped out my credit card and I registered ConcordiaX.ca, and I mapped the domain to a WordPress blog which is my sixth launch, launched yesterday. Actually, technically, I registered it last year, but the renewal came two days ago, so this has been, I've been squatting this domain for a year, figuring that if IITS wanted to do something with it, they would call me, but they didn't, or the lawyers, the Secretary General's office would contact me and issue me some kind of cease and desist, and they haven't. So, you know, I've been squatting it for a year, and I'm like, you know what, I think today, this presentation, this conference, and, and Mr. The President Shepard's speech yesterday, is the right timing to bring it, bring this open, open this to the community and say, hey, who else is interested in online learning, blended learning? And what I'm suggesting we do is first thing we have to uh, regulate the use of the insignia and name of the university. Because you know, I'm, I'm the kind of stickler that reads policies, right? And there is a policy on the use of the Concordia insignia. And so we have to set up a governing board or some kind of uh, advisory board for this project and request formally to the university the name of, the, the, the right to use the name of Concordia within the context of this project. So I am looking for a few good people to attach their name to this concept document, right? And we can draft a two-pager on the project, which I'm, I'm already drafting right now. And uh, this governing board would fill out the form attached to the policy of the, on the use of the Concordia insignia, submit it to the university, and hopefully get approved for use. It's kind of like a club, right? Like the Concordia Student Union did this a few, like, you know, a while back to get the right to use. Anybody can request the use of, you know, create a club. This is a club of people interested in this. And maybe we can have meetings, maybe we could share, maybe we can showcase, maybe, I don't know what's gonna happen here, but I know talking to a few other presenters and a few other faculty within this, pre this conference, I know there's a need for this. And so I'm, launch, I'm, I'm calling for volunteers for my Concordia Experimental. I call it Explore, Experiment, and Expose. That's the X, sorry. I'm, I'm the marketing librarian, so I gotta brand everything. Well, you know. <laughs> so you know it's the Amsterdam XXX, so <laughs> triple X. Um, so read it, I'm, I will open, I haven't opened the comments on this blog yet, I will do that momentarily, I just haven't had time, because I have to configure the theme and it takes a while, and I, I was doing that on the train, but then the, my cell phone access to this was potty, and it, uh, anyways, it's a pain, but I launched this in a day. And so that's uh, what I am uh, suggesting as a structure to create institutional support for these kinds of projects, but from the, the bottom up, this is the grassroots bandwagon type group. I'm gonna stop here because my time's over. I could talk a lot more about, one last thing I wanna mention, the problem with YouTube is if you wanna change a video, same topic, like I did a, a topic on a database called the Print Measurement Bureau. I improved it, 
you know, John and I didn't, didn't do that one, so I did it myself, and then I approved it again a few weeks later. If you change a video on YouTube, the URL changes. And so when I populated that URL in a bunch of different places, I have to re-update everywhere that I use that video. So what I've been doing for, to fix that problem is on, my, is on my blog, I want to create a page for each video that will have a stable URL. So for example, the Print Measurement Bureau video, I could use that URL from my blog, which is alpine.ca slash jmsv slash pmb, right? And then I could switch the video, increase the text, add more content within the context of that tag. Okay? So that's one of the things that I've realized using YouTube is if you change your video and you still want, you want to replace a video with another one that is better, you have to change the URL. So that kind of sucks. Because I know uh, I've, I've sent this specific video to students and faculty saying, if you need to use the PMB system, watch this video. Right? And if you use the YouTube URL, if they don't update it on their end, anyways, you, you get my point, right? So that's it, guys. Thanks for coming. I hope it was useful. And if, I don't know, I'll be around all day if you have questions in, in the hallway or anything, because I think we, I really am five minutes over, and there's a session at 10, if I'm not mistaken.